Halleluja. <laughs> oh, thank God. What a, what a privilege to be, just be able to be part of this conference, just to be able to be here. And uh, just overwhelming uh, honor and privilege that Pastor Greg has uh, given me to be able to minister to this great fellowship and this great assembly. What a great thing to be saved, huh? Great thing to know Jesus and, and labor together for the gospel. If you have your Bibles, uh, Titus chapter one. Uh, uh, if you're not uh, an American, uh, just please indulge me for a little bit. I, I, I want to talk a little baseball just for a second. Um, I, I'm no, by no means an expert, but earlier in this, in this baseball season, uh, the uh, Tony La Russa, uh, was the uh, coach of the uh, uh, manager of the uh, Chicago White Sox, playing against the Minnesota Twins. And uh, Tony La Russa is like, uh, he's 76 years old, he's, uh, he's, a hall, he's already in the Hall of Fame, right? He's in the Hall of Fame, one of the greatest managers there's ever been. But the, you know, the, the White Sox are just killing the Twins, right? Like it's like, I think 16 to four, and it's the ninth inning. And so the, the, the Twins put in like a position player for a pitcher, like it's not even worth, you know, putting a reliever in. We're just gonna, this guy's a first baseman, a catcher, sometimes third base, and he's gonna pitch. And so it's three balls and no strikes to this this rookie, I think he's a rookie that's up to bat. And, and so Tony La Russa, the, the manager, gives him the, the thing, just take the pitch, right? <laughs> just take the pitch. That's normal, three and all, like, manager decides, you know. But uh, no, uh, so the, 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 um, the pitcher, the position player, throws a 47-mile-per-hour fastball. <laughs> and this guy hits a home run, and the whole point was don't humiliate the other team, right? They are already losing so badly. The honorable thing, take a walk, take a strike. But uh, so Tony Russo was ticked, and he says, I'm going to discipline this guy. I don't know what he did, uh, uh, but, uh, but I was shocked. I, you know, I didn't spend a lot of time with this. Like, Tony Russo got no support of any kind for that call. Hey, the guy just is having some fun. You know, if you're paid millions of dollars to play a game, I think you're already having plenty of fun. <laughs> you know, well, I, you know, or it's just entertainment. Oh, is, okay, that's how we make our decisions, our honor decisions, right? Uh, um, what's most entertaining? That works. But here's the thing, that our, our culture today is all about, hey, it's, it's all about me, right? It's all about, don't limit me, Hall of Fame manager, <laughs> right? Don't let it, I, I, it, this, I'm here to shine. I'm here to shine. So that's in our culture, and that's in here. Oh, and that's in here. Oh, oh. <sighs> right, because I, I, I have to bring to your attention a, a scandal uh, in our fellowship, is that I've not been able to find in 42 years of pastoring a perfect pastor. <laughs> it's like... Imperfections like a pandemic. <laughs> Not only every pastor, but every person in our church has got the virus. <laughs> Imperfection. And it's serious, right? Because there, there are destinies at stake, marriages at stake, churches at stake, testimony in the earth is at stake. How, how can it be? that there's a group here of people, men of God, their wives, disciples contending for the will of God. How come, this is just a fraction of what God's doing in the earth. How come 
there are imperfect men who are, and women who are doing a glorious thing for God because they're under authority. Let's look at a familiar uh, passage here uh, from Titus. Uh, chapter 1, let's begin at verse 10. For there are many, and this is talking about who is picking for elders, pastors, there are many insubordinate, both idle talkers and deceivers, especially those of the circumcision, whose mouths must be stopped, who subvert whole households, teaching things which they ought not for the sake of dishonest gain. One of them, a prophet of their own, said, Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, lazy gluttons. This testimony is true. Therefore rebuke them sharply, that they may be sound in the faith, not giving heed to Jewish fables and the commandments of men who turn from the truth. And then verse 15, speak these things, exhort and rebuke with all authority. Let no one despise you. Clarity and authority. Let's think about muddied clarity for a moment. Now, when I'm talking about imperfection, I'm not talking about moral failure, right? I'm not talking about ethical failure. I'm not talking about abusing people. We're just talking about we are a flawed race, right? Like uh, that's, that's who we are always dealing with. We're not dismissing the larger issues that those don't need to be dealt with. But we are in a cultural moment when our self-will is being empowered as no generation has ever had its self-will empowered. Our reaction to the checking of our will is violent and visceral. If our will is thwarted, something very uh, intense comes out of us. See, Titus has been given authority to, uh, by the Apostle Paul, right? This is an extension of the Apostle Paul's authority, which is, which is an extension of God's authority. And he's been deputized, he's been delegated to finish putting things in order, which includes appointing pastors. The trouble is that he must face people who have been shaped more by their culture than by the gospel. They are exhibiting the same sins that dominate the culture around them. It, they've absorbed it. It's like the air that they breathe. It's like uh, the fish that doesn't know it's wet because it's swimming in water. It's so unconscious that they don't even recognize. For there are many insubordinate, both idle talkers and deceivers, especially those of the circumcision, whose mouths must be stopped, who subverve whole households, teaching things which they ought not for the sake of dishonest gain. One of them, a prophet of their own, said, Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, lazy gluttons. What is he saying? He's saying that in the church, in, in disciples, in potential pastors, there are those whose main ethic is not the gospel, but it's what has been seeped into their being from the culture. That word insubordinate means stubborn, <laughs> disorderly. I, this is a great word, contumacious. <laughs> That's stubbornly or willfully disobedient to authority, unmanageable. See, if you and I are going to fulfill the will of God in the earth, we must not be conformed to this world, right? The only way we're going to fulfill the good and perfect, acceptable will of God is if we're not conformed to this world. But we have to recognize that that is our natural condition and it has to be resisted. If our self-will is in place, then we cannot have clarity. Our self-will muddies the waters so we can't see right and wrong, right? We can't see the priorities and the, what, what is truly at stake. Jesus said, if anyone wills to do his will, he shall know concerning the doctrine, whether it is from God or whether I speak of my own authority. The reason that you're rejecting me is you don't really want to do the will of God. Your will is opposed to the will of God, and so when you hear me preach, you discount it. That still happens today. See, only a surrendered will will have clarity. 
See, the depraved minds that are under the indictment of the Apostle Paul in Romans 1, which includes all of humanity, it says, when the truth was clearly seen, when the truth was clearly seen, when they had clarity, they exchanged the clearly seen truth for a lie. They made a switch to serve their own lusts, desires, their own will, their own heart, their own likes. They rejected the clear, available knowledge of God and His will and substituted data which reaffirmed their own will. Their hearts, their foolish hearts were darkened. That, that, that's our default condition. Clarity is destroyed by self-will, rebellion, and willfulness. And the issue today, you know, that's first century, the issue today is that our self-will is being empowered, is being stroked, it's being pampered and encouraged through our psychology and through our technology. Our culture has for years told us we could have it our way at McDonald's. <laughs> hold the pickles, hold the lettuce. Special orders don't upset us, right? You can, you, you can have us. <laughs> Am I dating myself? <laughs> you haven't heard that one? <laughs> but see, now with the internet, it is all pervasive that we are connected most of the hours of the day and we're being conditioned to expect and demand and have reinforced what we want, right? Social media traces your usage and serves up more of what you want, more of what you desire, more of what you will, and then includes that anybody who doesn't agree with you or is in conflict with you is supremely evil. Web pages you visit have algorithms, and I don't even know what that word means, but some of you do. <laughs> algorithms that figure out what you're into and then funnel more and more of what you're into, what you want, so that you're your self-will is always being fed and reinforced and excused and empowered. See, we're, we're an imperfect people, each one of us here, each one of us in, that's going to be ministering this week. But there's hope for us if we can recognize how our self-will can deceive us. Instead of having intolerant and violent reactions to any check on our will. One man wrote, and I just say, the, the emergence of this kind of technology, the reinforcing of what we want, the emergence of this kind of technology and religious opposition to it, is likely to be the defining culture war of this century. Now those are some pretty sobering words because what that is saying is that the culture war may not be out there against LGBTQ, abortion, all of these things. That's a culture war. But the culture war comes right down into our assemblies. And when we try and bring the claims of the gospel to someone whose will is being continually reinforced, that that is going to define the culture war of our next generation. How does that jive with Jesus' command to take up your cross and follow Him, to deny yourself? Or Paul, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice? Our submission muscle has atrophied <laughs> for lack of use. For lack of exercise, our self-will has been empowered, reinforced, and ever before. Remember all those, that pandemic of imperfections that is rampant in the human race and even in our fellowship? We don't want our self-will empowered. 
right? Flawed people, flawed people don't want or shouldn't want <laughs> their self-will empowered. I preached a sermon on Father's Day uh, called Father's Day for Atelophobes. Atelophobes. Now, uh, I never heard that word before, but I was looking like, uh, what's, what's, there must be some phobia, some hatred for imperfection, and there is, that's what it is, atelophobes. So it's Father's Day for atelophobes, and the whole thing is, would you let dad off the, off the hook on Father's Day? Because, <laughs> you know, one of the things that's happened is that, uh, uh, you know, we know all about the failures of dads and fatherless and all of that, but, you know, the position of dad as an authority in the home has been so assaulted. And any little imperfection of dad, no, that's why I smoke crack, you know, that's why I do, you know, that's why, I, you know, I, I, I'm a boy trapped in a girl's body. That, that, you know, that's why all of this stuff, it's dad, 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 dad. No, it's self-will. We all have imperfection. Now, let's, let's look, secondly, at the issue of authority. Uh, because here's our, here's our hope. But here's another problem. Because one thing that is so prevalent in the Internet world is this issue of conspiracy theories. Now, uh, Stay with me. Um, do, you, do you know what? Conspiracy theories are an assault on authority. Just you pray about it. You think about it. Right? You can't trust anybody. I'm telling you, you put that in your people, Pastor, and it's going to come back on you. Because if you can't trust anybody in life, it's all a conspiracy and this and and, you know, I'm not going to use the names and all of that, but you just be very careful because at bottom, there's something that appeals to us about authority that we can despise and have contempt for and protect ourselves from. And it gets down to an issue that it can serve, that can feed our rebellion. See, institutions and organizations that at one time served to shape us into better people are now expected to serve our desires, our pride, and our self-absorption. You know, baseball has some codes of honor, you know, like, you know, don't humiliate your opponent, right? Don't hit a home run off of a, uh, off a position player that's just trying to get through nine innings and uh, and lessen the humiliation. Is that a rule? Where does it say that in the rule book? It's not in the rule book. It's something that's supposed to get inside of baseball players, right? It, it's, it's something where you can function and have honor for one another and treat each other with dignity, even if you are in opposition to one another. See, antidote for, the antidote for empowered, unchecked, self-will, our contumacy, our stubborn, willful disobedience to authority is this issue of an authority outside ourselves. Paul writes, this testimony is true, therefore rebuke them sharply that they may be sound in the faith. And chapter 2, verse 15, speak these things, exhort and rebuke with all authority, let no one despise you. Authority given by God through the apostle, delegated to the local pastor, and all authority, the authority of God moving across that lineage. You know, I've noticed over the years uh, some struggle sometimes as, as churches go through transitions. Like when a, when a, pastor, when a uh, pastor is able to go full time, it's odd what happens to people. They kind of liked being able to brag that their pastor didn't take a cent, he works for himself. Well, you know, thank God for all the fine men that do that, but that's not the 
ultimate will of God, right? Like if you really want to accept who a pastor is to be, you ought to be thrilled when he gets to go full time, right? If, if you don't, <laughs> yes. So if you can only be submitted, if he's working full time, then there's something wrong with you. How about it, when there's pastoral changes, especially if there's a pastoral change for the one who pioneered the church and someone who didn't pioneer it takes it over. Well, you didn't build this thing. I was there in the early days. I saw the sacrifice. Well, okay, Th that's wonderful. Always appreciate that uh, pioneering pastor. But you know, now God's ordained him, this guy. And so you don't get to believe in him just because of all the things he did. Now you have to kind of say, this is God's cho choice. This is God's man. This is what leadership has ordained to be in this place. And I need to submit to it. See, sometimes, we, yeah, if you build this thing, then we will respect you. If you don't build this thing, then we're not going to respect you. See, we have a fellowship structure. And our leaders are accountable too. Pastor Mitchell used to use this uh, uh, quote from time to time. He said, if society is something which can be understood, it must have structure. And if it has structure, it must have authority. If, if a fellowship is to be a fellowship, it's got to have structure. It's not every man or woman for himself. We can't all keep headed for the evangelization of the world if we're all each doing his or her own thing. And if there's structure, there needs to be hierarchy. Our leader, leadership, local churches, launching churches, and then people in submission to their pastor who's launched them. If you'll permit me to throw Shakespeare in here, I, um, he, <laughs> I just, I'm sorry, it's just a fascinating quote. And he's, uh, it, it, you know, it's in one of the plays and he's talking about this very issue and he's using the word degree and what he means by that is hierarchy. And he says, but take degree or hierarchy away and untune that string and hark what discord follows. Each thing meets in mere appugnancy, that's an antagonism, then each thing is going to be antagonism. The bounded waters should lift their bosoms higher than the shores and make a sop of all this solid globe. Strength would be lord of, of imbecility, that means weakness. Strength would be the lord of weakness. And the rude son would strike his father dead. Force should be right, or rather right and wrong should lose their names. And so should justice too. Then everything includes itself in power, power into will, will into appetite, and appetite an universal wolf, so doubly seconded with will and power, must make perforce an universal prey and at last eat up himself. See, the vacuum created by lack of submission to God's designated authority causes people to be exploited, violated, wronged. Our, our structure is a great protection for all of us. The problem is if you reject legitimate authority, you will simply embrace another authority that's illegitimate. We will serve somebody, the prophet Bob Dylan said, right? We, we will serve somebody. When they say, who, do you, who should we, you want Jesus or you want Barabbas? Give us Barabbas. We don't want Jesus, crucify him, we want Barabbas. Well, Barabbas was a rebel, the Bible says. They chose a rebel instead of the Messiah. That's in us. You've seen the signs, defund the police. Oh, that, that'll work. 
How about distrust the pastor? Distrust leadership. It gets back to the same thing, right? Yes, have there been wrongs and abuses? Yes. Have some bad things happened through a police officer from time to time? Yes. But you don't throw the police out because of a few bad seeds. See, clarity comes through headship. Again, the centurion. For I also am a man under authority, having soldiers under me, and I say to this one, go, and he goes, to another, come, and he comes, and to my servant, do this, and he does it. When Jesus heard it, he marveled and said to those who followed, assuredly, I say to you, I have not found so great faith, not even in Israel. Here is a guy who gets it. He gets how the kingdom functions, right? He understands that if there's going to be clear direction, it's got to come from authority down through the structure and submitted to. If, it, if that's not there, then it's chaos. And all the religious experts around Jesus that were rejecting him, this guy got it. This guy represented a clarity in the Roman Empire. And yes, it's a, it's a worldly thing, but a, they took over the world. If you and I have any concern about taking the world for Jesus then we ought to be really concerned about keeping right with our headship, keeping in right relationship with the structure and those who are over us in the Lord. Remember the pandemic of imperfections? Have you been tested? <laughs> Ask your wife. See, we have all things in us that left unchallenged can destroy us. If we can be corrected, then it diffuses the time bomb. We had leaders years ago. And anybody that knew these men, they were tremendous preachers, tremendous leaders, but they all had, you know, some significant character flaws. But as long as they were under headship, as long as they were under right relationship with Pastor Mitchell, those flaws were kept in check to, to some degree. <laughs> but as soon as you overthrow headship, then, right, then you consume yourself. And my imperfections will consume me and so will yours. See, only eternity is going to tell how many souls will ultimately perish because ministries that could have been producing soul winners, pastors, missionaries, evangelists were destroyed because somebody came out from under headship and their imperfection, their flaws of character consumed them and consumed their entire ministries. Leadership protects us from ourselves. And you know what? Sometimes leadership encourages us when we're down on ourselves. <laughs> Have you ever thought there was no hope for you? Okay, don't say, raise your hands, but I, I raised mine. See, let me just say, when you get corrected, I'm pretty much going to guarantee it's going to, you're going to be corrected by an imperfect person. And it may not be done absolutely perfectly. But that's the thing. Rebels always quibble over process. Wow, but he didn't, and he didn't talk, and he said, yeah, but let's, but you did it, right? Well, uh, okay. But you know what else? It's also a great comfort and encouragement to your church because they see your flaws. If they, I know sometimes they bring them to our attention, <laughs> but a lot of times they don't, but they see them. But you know what? They say, I'm okay. 
because I know my pastor is submitted to his pastor. I know my pastor can be corrected. I know that he's not a loose cannon, and I am totally subject to his whims and character flaws. No, because he's a man under authority, that I'm safe. I want to close with a thought here of the Spirit. Because I have, I'm concerned here, like, uh, I, I'm, I'm so grateful for uh, Pastor Warner's ministry yesterday, Pastor Willis Gordon uh, ministry last night. Uh, they, you know, obviously these things are being touched on, and none of us is, is uh, declaring this is the first time you've ever heard any of this. But this is a time where we need it. And it's also to recognize that some people's submission, because many of the people that we've dealt with as, as rebels, uh, we've, at one time they were submitted. What happened? See, we're not talking about submission as that's temporary or superficial. Paul says, let no one despise you, right? This is, this is something besides just, hey, respect me, don't despise me, right? This is, this is recognizing that this is something that you, you need to exercise. Don't be put off if it's not received. Be willing to exercise that. Be willing to stay in right relationship with me. See, here's the thing. As long as people's self-interest is being served, their will isn't being checked. But the moment, as we've heard, the moment you're told no, then, oh, then the self-interest manifests. Or when you're corrected. And when it's not done perfectly, perhaps. And when you didn't get your way, and when maybe your flaws are exposed, or maybe because you've got a grievance, you've got an offense that you won't take care of righteously. As we've heard, these things can stay inside of people for decades. They're not really submitted. And so, submission, authentic submission, is a miracle. Authentic submission is a miracle. What does it take for our rebellious hearts? Right, our hearts are deceitful above all things and desperately wicked, and there is no cure. What do you do if there's no cure? Well, you just take the medicine. You just do the therapy <laughs> that keeps it from killing you. And that's submission to headship. Submission to headship is a profoundly sacred and spiritual, capital S, spiritual thing. We don't, we don't fully comprehend. You and I as a fellowship, you and I as local churches, as churches under mother churches, we are in covenant. We are in sacred covenant. You know, when Jesus instituted the Lord's Supper, when he said, this is a new covenant in my blood, and he 
passed it, had them pass around a cup. This was pre-COVID. They had them pass around the cup. And says, all of you drink from the same cup. Now today we have little plastic things that just, okay. The point is that the new covenant is not just you and Jesus. It's not just you and Jesus. It is you and the people of God that he has ordained you to be a part of, including the headship that is over that and how far up the ladder that goes. It's a profoundly sacred thing. Hear somebody say, I have quit going to church and I'm closer to Jesus than ever. Uh, Not the Jesus I know. (laughs) Jesus I know is the head of the church. He sets them in the body as it pleases him. (laughs) What he does in the earth, he does through his body. If you're not part of a body, then you cannot be doing the will of God. Impossible. When Jesus told the the disciples uh, how to pray, when they asked, "How how do we pray? He didn't say, well, pray my Father. He said, pray our Father. That meant that, yes, we have to have our own individual relationship with God. That's another whole sermon. But we're, we're talking about, right, this is the, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We come as a people asking that. That prayer is going to be answered through a people, not just me and Jesus. You know, that was one of the, you know, this is, of course, before my time, but, you know, back in the Jesus movement, you know, a lot of people, uh, you know, would come through the Prescott Church, and they're like the Jesus people, they're hitchhiking, and, you know, they, they, they have, they're not committed to anybody. Well, those folks are probably psychos, probably in institutions today. <laughs> the thing that said our fellowship is apart, apart is that Pastor Mitchell brought people into commitment to a body began to minister the gospel, make disciples. See, we have apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers, right? That, that's how God does, but it's also that which every joint supplies. That's how we fulfill the will of God. See, it is only the submitted son, his The Lord Jesus Christ, his character formed in us supernaturally that can give us the submission that survives all the things that can assault it, most of them coming from inside of us. He's the one that said, not my will, but thine be done, and went to the cross in obedience to God and for your salvation and mine. This is the one, as Pastor Warner mentioned in Philippians, right, who did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but emptied himself and uh, took the form of a servant and humbled himself even to the point of death, even death of a cross. Submitted, obedient. Submitted to the Father even when it required him to go to the cross, even when it required him to be forsaken. See, that can only be produced in us supernaturally by the Spirit of God. We didn't read these verses, but they're in the next chapter. Not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to His mercy, He saved us through the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit, whom He poured out on us abundantly through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Regeneration, that's literally Genesis again. Genesis all over again. This is, this is what salvation is. It's like here is a, a world cursed by sin. Here is a world cursed by sin. But now, through the regeneration that comes by the Holy Spirit, there's a new Genesis, like a new birth that's taken place, something gloriously new inside of us. 
that can purge, that can overcome self-interest and stubbornness and restore relationship with God. And the renewing, the renewing of the Holy Spirit, which involves the renewing of our minds. See, what's the answer to the depraved minds of Romans chapter 1? It's the renewed mind available in Romans chapter 12. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world. Don't be brute beasts. Don't be the rebels that are outside of these walls. You, you get upset when they're trying to burn down Portland, so do I. But it, that thing can be in you and me. Maybe it's not politically expressed. More dangerously, it's spiritually expressed. But be not conformed to this, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. The depraved mind of Romans 1. Many people call themselves Christians. Many are insubordinate. Many are rebellious. The thing, so they're serving God with a depraved Romans 1 mind. It's the Romans 12, now all that Jesus has done, now through the cross, through the blood, through the work of the Spirit, your mind can be renewed. See, the realize, the issue, if we're not going to be conformed to our culture, if we're not going to have those visceral reactions against any check on our will, if we're not going to com complain and, and crumble and just be a religious version of the spirit of our age, then we're going to need to repent, right? We're going to need to repent, get down, and, and we're not talking, okay, yeah, I, I probably shouldn't have done that. That was kind of rebellious. No, like, let get down, peel the onion down to the heart. That came out of this thing in here. A broken and a contrite heart I will not cast out. A broken and a contrite heart I will not cast out. Now it's just somebody said, okay, oops, slips. Repent of that rebellious spirit. Forgive grievances, offenses. If, you, if they need to be dealt with, go and deal with them righteously. If you're bitter, get your heart right. Surrender to the will of God and surrender to your pastor in submission and in respect. Allow the Word of God to reprogram your brain. Let's just be real. If you're spending 15 minutes reading your Bible and three hours on the Internet having your will reinforced, which is the most influential in your life? Pray. Pray. Not just speak in tongues and be looking around for 45 minutes. Like, pray. Like, God... I, this, heal me, <laughs> help me. I don't want to destroy myself or anybody else. And then walk in the spirit. What is that? Well, I think it, it at least means when you feel that thing rises up. No, no, that thing is not having right of way in my heart. I'm, I renounce it. I repent right here as I'm walking down the street. Spirit of God. Lord Jesus, by the Spirit, Father, by the Spirit, give me a submitted, grateful, large heart. See, in all the confusion that is, exists in the world, we have to recognize a thing that muddies. We could talk about the devil. We haven't even mentioned it. Yes, and, and we need to. That outstanding ministry yesterday. But my biggest enemy is not the devil. My biggest enemy is I look at in the mirror. And when we lose sight of that, just close with this. It, it's a little painful for me to share because this is about Nick Foles. Uh, Nick Foles uh, won the Super Bowl 
in 2017, a backup quarterback, and he beat the uh, <clears throat> New England Patriots. And so, um, uh, <laughs> and, <laughs> and he, by some estimates, he, he beat the GOAT, right? Maybe the greatest quarterback of all time, some say. I'm just, uh, <laughs> but, but you know, he was MVP. He, he won the Super Bowl, he was MVP. He was a backup quarterback, and in the next season, he was demoted back to backup quarterback. Now, how about that? Wait! Wait! <laughs> I won the Super Bowl for you guys. I was the MVP. MVP. <laughs> but here's what he writes. Responding to the people who were saying how dirty he was treated. He said what they saw as a riches to rags sports story. I see as part of God's divine plan. I've said all along that my desire is to play for God's glory, not mine. Haven't you said that? I remember saying that college student working in a youth group, just glorify your name, Lord. <laughs> That's been challenged a time or two. <laughs> I've said all along, my desire is to play for God's glory, not mine, and that's exactly what I plan to do. My unique path from backup to Super Bowl MVP to backup again is a powerful message to share with people. And God has given me an ideal platform to do that, to cheerfully return to a backup role after reaching the pinnacle of the sport contradicts everything the world tells us about success, fame, money, and self-worth. To me, it's a tangible reminder that we are called to humility and a life of service. Some people might think I deserve a better deal, but it's not about what I deserve. It's never been about that. The truth is, I've already been given far more than I deserve. A wonderful family, a job I love, grace and forgiveness, great friends, coaches and teammates, everything I have as a gift from God, I'm thankful for all of it. I am where I am now because of God's grace and I'll continue to follow wherever he leads. That guy's saved. And you just uh, put fellowship and pastor and fellow pastors and leaders in all of those slots where he was talking about football. We're just talking about the NFL. Is it for the glory of God? Can you take a lesser place? Is it all about you? Have you embraced the world's value system? Or are you allowing the Holy Spirit to renew your mind and set you free from, yeah, amen. Pastor Heinberg, God bless you.